Thank you very, very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I'm hoping this also will not be my last lecture. <laughs> I work in bioethics. It's a field. Um, it's also something of an obsession for me. And tonight I want to talk about something that isn't that at all. For more than a decade, I've studied and taught about the way that the cutting and really even bleeding edge of technology affects ordinary people, our students, our parents, our friends, our children. And for somebody in my field, every day since the birth of Dolly has been even more amazing. Because we do live in a time of biotechnology innovation. Our lives are constantly transformed in ways none of us would ever have imagined when we were children. When I work in my classroom, I do, as you do, try to communicate a sense of wonder and optimism and to give the bigger, broader sense that the things that we do in our classroom are inspired themselves by our desire to solve problems and to help others who want to solve problems. Most of the time, the things that I talk about feel optimistic to me because I'm less scared by Dolly than I am encouraged by the capacities that we've developed to uh, do things like genetic engineering. And it is true that for everyone who shares that optimism, who believes that this power we have to understand ourselves, to make better food, to build better houses, that this power is incredible, there's at least another one person, and sometimes two, who are scared to death. They're worried about what happens when randomness and diversity get taken out of the equation, or about how much gets lost when you reduce me to just genetics, to just A, T, G, and C. Most of the time I've been the optimist. Lately, I find myself worrying. But today, I want to turn it upside down and ask a question about what happens when the technology we develop, the innovation, the transformation we give to our students turns backwards, and we find out what we lose. So I want you to think for a second about loss. Loss can take lots of different forms. You recognize this guy. If you can't see him way back in the back, this is Tom Hanks from a movie called uh, uh, Castaway. And this is just after his, uh, his FedEx plane comes careening out of the sky. And he finds himself, well, I guess, lost. Uh, but more than that, he finds himself in a situation where there really isn't an easy way to solve the problem. Let me, let's try this with a simple example. How many of you have lost your keys in the last month? Raise your hands. OK. How'd that feel? What's that? Scary. Scary. OK, that's good. That's friendly. I lose my keys quite a bit, and I feel stupid. Um, but that's me. How about if it gets a little worse? Have you ever forgotten where you parked your car? OK, me too. This doesn't go in the view book for the school at all, I promise. That's worse, right? And when you can't find your car, you go from wondering where you found yourself and how did this happen to something bigger. You need help. You can't move forward without an actual solution to the problem. It gets worse, though. How many of you have had a hard drive failure? Anybody? Ever push that on button and, and it says, I don't know, your favorite version, will not start, control all, right? How'd that feel? Horrible? Frustrating? Angry. Exactly. These feelings, that feeling, that's what I want you to think about. When I say lost, I want you for a minute, and only for a minute, to contemplate a feeling that the phenomenologist Husserl calls the aporia. It's a jutting out place. It's effectively, literally, in the Greek, that you just can't move forward. It's a kind of dilemma where no matter what you say to yourself, no matter who you bring in, you can't get forward without confronting the reality of what's awful. And there are all kinds of loss, right? You can win or you can lose. You can get lost in an experience. You can have acceptable losses in war. You can have losses and gains when you invest. But the kind of loss that people in my field typically focus on is the loss where you have to confront it to move forward because if you don't, your life loses meaning. When you lose your keys, you can't drive without them, but you could still walk, right? When you lose your car, you not only can't really get around, but even if you walk, you know there's a car that you left somewhere, right? And when you lose your hard disk, you lose the abilities that it gives you, so you can't you know, have things that spin. You don't have ideas you can see. Your pictures are gone. Um, but you also lose the computer itself. And then on top of it, you lose so much more, because you can't get your job done, right? Because you don't know what it was that you lost unless you remember every single file, every single picture, and the rest of it. This is what I mean by lost. 
Now, how much exactly can you lose with a computer? Let's take the hard disk example back and then forward. This is a picture of, of, of a computer I can actually remember pretty well from 1984. Remember that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Back when 1984 won't be like 1984. This, this computer ran on 512K drives, right? This picture is more than 512K, <laughs> right? And, and when you look at this, you can imagine it, losing this. Now, I, mine was in 1984, which is really long, long time ago. I did have high school papers on a disc. And when a disc was gone, to me at the time, it seemed awful, you know, like waiting for Godot, awful. Things are bad. But now, when you think about what you could possibly lose with a computer that size, it doesn't seem quite so awful. So fast forward, everybody, you know, all of us sort of have some sense of the distinctions and differences between old technology and new technology. We all have heard six million times, many of us in this room teach all the time, this idea that, you know, your iPhone has enough power to launch all the ships that ever sailed and fly to the moon and the rest of it. I don't know if it's true. It sounds absolutely fabulous. But what matters for our purpose is tonight, I want you to consider loss that goes far beyond losing a hard disk, far beyond losing the, the parameters of the material you keep in your, your digital information on, on any device. I want you to think about losing your identity. Because today, most Americans' identities are defined in large part by the data that passes through the internet. Nicholas Negroponte, one of my favorite books called Being Digital, right, describes this transformation that's happened to all of us, everyone in this room such that we can't even have an experience anymore without having it converted at least once and usually dozens of times into ones and zeros. Every picture we take, every recording we hear is compressed and enlarged, encrypted and passcoded and patented and trademarked and the rest of it. It's astonishing and it's growing because we're all multitasking all the time, lots of it and very fast. Our experiences and maybe much more important really, those of our students, are defined by technologies that I actually have trouble understanding at all. Snapchat? Really? And this is old school now, right? They send messages to each other, they get them, and they disappear. And they're okay with that. For me, the idea of a disappearing message, I mean, you know, there are times it could be okay, but, <laughs> but mostly it's kind of scary. Our experiences are data from the start, and I'll prove it to you. How many of you have a smartphone in your hand right now? How many of you have one on the, that's a quarter. How many of you have one on the table? Okay, so for those of you who have a phone on the table, how many of you posted an image to social media today? Okay, so about a dozen or so. Did you own that image? Is it yours? No? Why not? Who owns your images? Facebook? Mark Zuckerberg? So that's the question. When you create a thing now, a document you write, you put it through Turnitin, whose is it? When you take a picture and you give it to Mark Zuckerberg, is it yours? I mean, I'm pretty sure he doesn't care about my pictures. They're not great to begin with. But, but are they his? I'm not sure. And I think in a way that's part of what makes it so complicated to understand why our students see data as transformational. Because this thing for us, this, this EULA thing is all we have anymore of ownership. Property defines American law at the most basic level. It is core to our Constitution. But in the digital world, everything has this really complicated contract. And you have to say yes if you want to play. But you can fast forward that thing for pages and pages of 10-point font, and you'll never really know what it says. Every app you download, every game you've played, every data storage technique you use, all of your messages, all of your email, it's all been licensed in that way by a EULA, an end user licensing agreement. Every album, every movie, all of it everywhere is password protected, but more than that, required you to say yes. Now, I'm not, not a cybersecurity scholar. I'm not an attorney, I'm not an engineer, actually not lots of things. But what I'm pretty confident that I know is ethics. And in my field, when I see encryption, and the story I'm going to tell you about it, I get scared. And when I see our students and how they think about what's happening to them in the transformation that takes place in college, it makes me think that the next 10 years are likely to be much more transform transformative for education than the last 10 ever were. Why? Because I think we don't know what we're agreeing to. But more than that, as we agree, we look in data a lot like the world I've studied in medicine from the 1950s. Are you familiar with the term paternalism? 
Right? This, is, this is the model where we go to a physician, and it's a physician in the paternalism model, and it's a he in the paternalism model, and we say we're sick, and then we wait passively while they decide what they're going to do to us. We say yes, we're okay with it, and we comply. All kinds of language in medicine is built this way. If you have a, a miscarriage, it's a failure. If you are unable to do what you're supposed to do, you are non-compliant. If you leave, it's against medical advice. Paternalism is gone in medicine. But in the data world, despite incredible technologies and the appearance that what we're doing is customized and beautiful and transformational, most of us are agreeing to contracts that really look a lot like we're talking to Marcus Welby or Jack Klugman, right? The problem is we don't have metaphors yet for what we do when we put our identity online. Uh, we had a visitor last week, uh, Gene Spafford from Purdue, gave a, a, a lecture in the College of Engineering, and he described this. He said, we just don't have ways to describe these contracts, these metaphors. We don't know what to do, and so we make up the wrong metaphors. We say we're no networking, right? Our students are doing social media. What is that? Right? We're not sure exactly what world they're in or whether or not they're vulnerable, but we know that we ourselves, that's us in this room right now, we are last year's model. We look and smile at Snapchat and Facebook and understand that they are politely enjoying the fact that we're not like them. That world, for me, has always revolved around something that is not at all like paternalism. It's more like naked, blind trust. I was that guy who loves Steve Jobs. And lots and lots of us in this room are also that guy and that gal. And that sense, that trust, is what fuels our agreement to the EULA for many, many people. We either have friends who agree to use social networking, or we ourselves uh, come to believe that that thing, that Mac, um, it, it's backed by Steve Jobs. So if I click OK, at least they're probably not nefarious. That feeling that we have has, for me, always been a part of kind of being an early adopter. I was one of those people who waited all night for the first and second and third and, honestly, fourth and fifth iPhone. <laughs> After iPhone 6, I got old, my knees hurt, and the rest of it. But I recognize this behavior in my students, and frankly, it's the kind of enthusiasm that drove the biotechnology revolution. It drove people to stay up all night trying to crack the human genome. My career as a professional, to be blunt, up until now anyway, has been largely the result of a wager, a guess. I thought it would be cool to make a website about bioethics. And I mean, I can make up philosophical reasons why it would be cool, but the truth is I came up with this URL and I bought it while it was still available. And I built a little website on it. And, and then after that, it was just good luck. People thought bioethics was interesting and they wanted to talk about it after someone said they were going to clone a person or someone killed someone in the back of their rusty van named Kevorkian or someone said that they were going to sell organs from one country to another. People wanted to talk about it. The internet was there. Early adoption paid off. And it still does in high technology, whether it's forensics or whether we're talking about engineering new buildings and new bridges. That, for me, was a way of understanding my professional life, and many of you have that in common with me. And from that follows the technologies that we often use to organize what Steve Jobs called our digital lives. Think about it. When you work that way, you live that way. We're carrying these computers around with us, and they aren't distinct. I have friends who work in government, and they've got a laptop for this and a laptop for that, and, you know, the pager culture, right? But we don't think that way, we academics. And so we organize things, and for me, in my case, for 20 years, I can tell you that virtually every picture I've ever taken, everything I've ever written, every talk, every lecture, all of it is stored in a computer somewhere, digital upon digital upon digital. If there's a EULA, I've clicked it. Summer and I calculated that when I moved to Germany in 2012, we had packed up 19 file cabinets worth of material from journals and so on and scanned it all, something like 750,000 emails. And altogether, it still fit quite nicely into a Mac computer. UNH is like that. We live those lives. We've got Wi-Fi so fast around here, you'd think we'd all be high, right? <laughs> And UNH is friendly to technology because it wants us to innovate. So at UNH, like many of you, I was issued a standard issue MacBook with enough computing power to get us around the world several times. It is truthfully, though, not about the data anymore as it's stored in a device. What we all have now, and this, the root really of the story I want to tell you, is our access to a thing called the cloud. So I'm going to tell you my story of the cloud. The amazing thing about Mac is that it is built on this idea of making early adoption safe. And basically, the 20 teens are defined by three experiences that all come from Apple and are all transformative. Setting up a Mac is a breeze, and 
it's a breeze because Steve Jobs made all those gambles a long time ago and decided that he was willing to weather the storm. Beginning in about 2014, when you first started using a new Mac, it would suggest that you enable something called file vault encryption. In fact, it actually defaulted to it. So you could say, no, 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 please don't encrypt my data. But you'd have to tell it that you don't agree with its paternalist view that your data is special and needs to be chopped up into tiny bits and pieces. So when they suggested encryption to me, I said yes. When Apple suggested another new option, another of its transformative technologies, which was to link the password to all of your data, everything in the Apple iCloud, right, to the password with your computer, to the password with all backup drives, I agreed to that too because, you know, I'm getting old, I can't remember things, one password's better than five. Apple also introduced what may be the most important of the locking and transformation technologies, which is 2014, a technology that came directly from healthcare called two-factor authentication. People put tons of passwords in their computers. You're not just carrying around your love notes and your letters and the rest of it. You're also carrying around zillions of text messages that have telephone numbers and social security numbers and data that could compromise you. And at UNH, we have people like A. Begili who study that at the most microscopic level, understanding the level of threat that you might find and how you might deal with it. Well, Apple understood that was a big problem. And so it built two-factor authentication so that as soon as you build this into your computer and accept their their wish that you be authenticated, you get a printed out 14 digit recovery key. Here's mine. I took a picture of it after I had mine issued. And with this key, as long as you have a paper copy of it, you will always be able to get in your computer. You lose your password, no problem, because this recovery key is going to get you back in. Now, I'm Again, getting older, so I took a picture with my iPhone. That way I'd have a copy of my recovery key <laughs> in case I should ever lose. I knew they'd laugh if I said that. Because once you go digital, really, truthfully, how likely are you to keep track of paper anymore? And that brings us to the genesis of the story, which is March 5th, 2015. I don't know if you remember this day, but it snowed a lot. March 5th of last year, most of you were probably doing what I was doing, which is getting ready for the classes that you weren't going to be able to uh, uh, go to that day, and then preparing for what you do over the next few days. For me, it was a snow day, which meant a day to catch up. Lots of email, lots of people who wanted things that I hadn't been able to do, so I did that. I had my really amazing Mac with all the data I've ever gotten anywhere in it, all encrypted, two-factor authenticated, and locked behind one password. And that's what I did. I, I worked on it. I deleted junk mail. I was multitasking. And while I typed away, working on my stuff just like you, my laptop reminded me that it was time to change my password. So I made a new one. And then I... I typed it into my notebook, because that's where I put my passwords. I keep them in there. I've got zillions of them for everything from, you know, AAA to American Airlines all the way down to things that begin with Z. And, and, and having written it down, I felt comfortable going to get a cup of this really awful tea that Summer buys that smells like, I don't know, flowers-ish. Uh, I poured it in. It was really aromatic, and I remember that now, because when I came back, my computer had gone to sleep, and it asked me for my password. I think it was the T, because I couldn't remember the password. And when I started to type a password, the Apple said, no, that's, that's not it. So I typed again, I said, what is this password? I know I've changed it. It's marker, it's magic, it's, I don't know, I type it, no. And now I realize, what's happened is, Apple has changed the password, not just to my Apple account, but to my computer. Okay, no problem. I'm starting to race a little bit though because I didn't do the integrity lecture yet and the T is really awful and you know I'm going to be really embarrassed if I can't remember this password. So it's okay, I, I try one more time and then I think, you know, there's a notebook here. I just have to go to the notebook. The notebook's in my phone, right? So I open up my iPhone and, uh, oh wait, it's one password for everything. Not just for the computer, not just for the cloud, but also for the phone. And so my computer and my phone have changed, and, and, and I'm going to get the, the password out of the notebook. I know I'll be able to find it, but I can't get into my phone. And I can't get into iCloud, and I can't get in there on the web either. So I run upstairs, and I find an old iPad, which has the notebook, and I can get into the iPad. But you can see there was, there was all kinds of digits, and I had the presence of mind to remember I'd be giving a last lecture in a year and a half. So I took a picture. <laughs> 
Anyway, don't pay attention to the passwords, please. But the, in any of it, no, again, no, it was very quickly propagated with the new password. So I'm not going to be able to get in. And I finally remember I do have one fail-safe memory. Um, and so I turn and, and, and I ask, what did I change my password to? And she says, I don't know. You didn't tell me this time. Right. <laughs> so now I'm panicked. I get in the car, and I brave the snow, and I get security to let me into Maxi. And I walk in the office, and I look for the recovery key paper, because it's important, right? And, and, and I know it's in a, a file called Essential Documents, in that file cabinet that's next to my little desk with the little chair. I know exactly where it is, right? And, 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 it's, and it's not there, because I don't know where the file, because it's just gone. So it's no problem, because I remember, I took a picture of this thing, and it's in, it's in the camera. Um, so no problem, I just open, except it's in the computer, right? Okay, not a problem. All I really need is just to get to an old copy of my pictures, because this has been, you know, a few months. That means it's in a backup drive, right? So I get the backup drive, open it up, start looking, and, and the backup drive has connected itself to Apple, where Apple has told the backup drive that the account of Glenn McGee has a new password. Great. That's excellent. Thank you, Steve Jobs. So it's time to call for help. I dial 1-800, this is a number, SOS Apple, and I offer to answer questions. I say, look, lady, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you my mother's maiden name. I'll tell you where I lived when I was a child, my favorite elementary school, whatever you want to know. I know all of it. And she says, no, you, remember, the reason why you opted into the Apple program for security is because with all your social networking, you wanted to be sure that it would be safe. And it's safe. It's so safe. No data will be found unless I know the password. Really, no data, because they don't know the password, because the encryption algorithm created from the recovery key is impenetrable to Apple. Remember the FBI case? That's this. So I have a few more friends to call, one who, who ran, ran Genius Bar for the Northeast, and it occurs to me that he might know something about this. So he, he calls the mothership in, in Cupertino, the actual mothership there with a couple of my kids, and, 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 and I have a t-shirt from this place, so I know they're going to help. I mean, this is Steve Jobs' company, right? And I'm getting a little anxious about that. So I've tried a bunch of combinations, and the guy from Cupertino tells the guy from, from Albany to tell me that, that, that the problem at this point isn't going to be that I don't know the password. It's going to be that I've tried it too many times. And that, in fact, actually, it could, it could really get worse because, you see, if, if you try it too many times, then you'll do what computer geeks call bricking a computer. You know this word? Yeah, well, that's what it sounds like. Meaning it will be impossible to use the computer ever again because, see, the computer is locked to the passcode that's locked to the encryption, meaning I have created a giant metal frisbee. <laughs> you didn't think I'd talk about this, did you? After hours on the phone, an email with Apple support, and the Genius Bar, and the lead software engineer, it becomes clear to me there is basically no hope of recovering my computer, my data. I have lost it all, all of it. And I began to contemplate what this means. Every picture I've ever had, gone. Every talk I've ever given, every lecture, 700,000 some odd emails. Every purchase I've ever made on iTunes, every song, every movie, every app, I don't own those anymore. Because Apple can't find out what I own because the account is locked with the password. Millions of Americans in exactly the same situation, and not one of them was as stupid as me. The Apple people begin to explain to me the dimensions of this, but it's already dawned on me that what I've lost isn't like anything I know that anyone I know has ever lost. I've literally lost my digital life. I don't even know what that is, but it feels a lot like losing your memory, because what I don't know is what music did I have, <laughs> right? Whose picture did I mean? It's baby pictures. It's sad. I can tell you in principle. I have a lot of pictures, and a lot of them are awful. They were pictures of me, right? But many of them are important, which I don't know. So losing, losing in this world is really about the question of what's at stake. And remember, I've also lost the laptop, so I'm thinking at this point I might actually be giving my last lecture at UNH. <laughs> so I take this picture uh, the next morning, and I'm basically in shock. The snow stops, 
and I'm ready to return to work now, but I really don't have anything to work on. I don't have any notes. I'm not sure what I'm going to do in class. There's stuff on Blackboard, so I can, I can look at that. But, 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 but I look at Summer and I say, you know, what am I going to do? And she says, Right. Because the guy I want to talk to when I've done something this dumb is Abe Begeely. <laughs> so I contacted him and Frank Breidinger and their students in the lab of the unpronounceable algorithm, uh, acronym CFRAG, uh, and I give them the challenge of a lifetime. I try as, to be as persuasive as I can. I say, would you like to break Apple's two-factor authentication encryption? I don't even know what that is but I'm sure no one's done it, and it turns out it really probably hadn't been done. So at this point, I really don't have a whole lot to lose. I turn over my computer, and a team of students, undergraduate and graduate students, mostly graduates, begin what Abe often calls challenge-based learning. They begin trying to copy the solid-state disk drive that I have in this little computer, this one actually, and they get more and more compelled to figure out what's at stake. I do worry for a minute or two that they might break into it immediately and see all the stuff in my computer, you know. But that's okay. What really, really is stunning about the process is the amount of motivation that they find, and I find over the course of the next week, that they're asking me questions that, while they are kind of annoying, are exactly the sorts of things you want your students to ask. You need them to ask in order to understand that you are transforming them with something that actually counts as real experiential learning. They are running around this computer. They've got it lifted and turned sideways. They've plugged it into devices I don't understand. And while I can tell that they're not really able to copy it because it's all encrypted, um, I can see that they're learning about the nature of encryption, but it looks like they're learning almost by osmosis. We don't make much progress. They don't spare my feelings either. A 21-year-old graduate student asked me why I would ever have trusted Apple. <laughs> Another tells me that since I can only remember that the first letter is M, and I'm pretty sure about that, and the last two characters I'm almost 100% sure are one and star, it should be no problem to guess the password. It'll just take about 1,500 years. <laughs> and he's serious, right? But no one's ever done it. The questions they ask, and the questions my own students ask, is this becomes a part of a conversation across not one, not two, but multiple classes and seminars and time outside of class. They become more interesting, frankly, as I begin to think of this question in terms of its phenomenology, in terms of what this means and why we study what we study. The question really is, are we too dependent on a digital life? And would we be better if we didn't put so much of our lives into places where they're either secure or they don't work? One of them says, well, what have you lost if you just give up? I mean, we're not going to find the password, right? You're, 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 we're all being open here. Couldn't you just start over? And then Abe says, well, look, you could, you could really begin a new path. <laughs> really? Become an engineer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But he has an idea that transformed, frankly, my entire career. He says, you do the ethics, I'll do the data, and we'll find a way to turn this into a book project. I said, that's okay, but first you've got to make me actual Lazarus, right? I mean, I'd like to come back from the dead hard disk, and, and then we can write about the book when we can laugh about it. He doesn't laugh at that. People who lose in the world of medicine go through stages of grief that I think most of us are familiar with, and many of us in this room probably teach. The first is, of course, denial. I respond to Abe and his students, and Frank, with a continuous chant, we will get the password, remember? Over and over again, don't tell me it can't happen. It will happen. Then we get angry. Cooper Ross says that the angry phase is, of course, the most difficult one for the family. There is no way, I say, that Apple can just take everything that I put into iCloud, that it can just be gone. They can't tell me I don't own it merely because they can't find it. They can't keep all the pictures that I put into photos. They're there. They're on the drive. They're in the cloud. They're actually there. Forget this, EULA. I didn't actually agree. And then most of us who are working through something like grief move to a stage that looks like sadness or depression. It's time to give up, right? I mean, everybody's right. I've lost everything, and it isn't just the music and the pictures. It's knowing which ones exist at all. I not only don't have the things that were mine, I don't even know what I had. 
And then that next stage, you start to bargain. I say to Apple, they must have a list of everything I've ever purchased. They could just create a new account at iCloud and reinstate these purchases to that account. Well, Avid and students start to have a little bit more luck. And in the second week of March, it begins to look like maybe it'll be less than a year to make some progress, or at least some data will be found sooner. At least that's how it looks to me. And no matter what, I can see that the exercise is giving them and lots of my colleagues and me, if not a good laugh, at least a really interesting educational experience. And then there's a breakthrough. A company in California, and you're looking at the software here, who really seem to be Russian, in fact, I think it's pretty clear now that they are Russian, <laughs> have a tool that lets them apply brute force, this is really brute force, um, to the disk by guessing the password using dozens and dozens of copies. And they figured out now how to image the laptop. So they image the disk and they set it up on a whole bunch of these computers with fairly creative ideas that uh, students came up with with how to move it. The students are transfixed and they are smashing away at this computer over and over again, hundreds of thousands of different copies and attempts. Nope, not yet. 1 billion. Thank you. 1.7 billion passwords per second. And it looks like Dr. Strangelove, really. I mean, Peter Sellers should roll through this room. Days turn to weeks. And I recognize that there are a lot of combinations in 1.7 billion passwords. So, and to be honest, I began recreating my digital life from years old hard disks, not connected with iTunes or iCloud or any clouds or tunes or even with Apple. I start recreating lectures from memory because my classes have to be taught. And I actually find myself beginning to think in new ways. I get an old laptop out of a box and I begin working on it because I have to. I've reached what we'd say in Kubler-Ross language is the stage of acceptance. Now I've taught hundreds of medical students Kubler-Ross's theories, but I never particularly found it helpful. I'm with the find the password crowd, right? <laughs> But this time I felt it, and something else happened, and it happened not just to me, but to my students and Abe's students and Frank's students and students all around us, which is we began to realize that this is what we love, not the mess, not losing the stuff, but this problem of understanding passwords in terms of your life, in terms of the way in which we have to find solutions in order to understand digital life in transformative ways. And that's what I think happens. Loss transfigures us. It transmogrifies us sometimes. And when I was thinking about what I would say or what I'd talk about in the last lecture and what message I would want to share if I could only talk one more time, I thought about all kinds of things, genomics and gene therapy, things that we're doing right now that are absolutely amazing in the biotechnology world. And it didn't occur to me for a second that this was the thing I should think about. It occurred to Summer. And I know why, right? Because one of the most pivotal facts about loss is that loss begets loss. The metaphors of illness, and in particular cancer, are very much characterized by the fact that we really do measure ourselves by whether or not we fight hard enough to keep away the thing that we think will take us. In Tuesdays with Maury, right, maybe the most important uh, of the, the stories about a last lecture, it's told vividly. That's what can happen. It's an awful thing that happens to professors. My father was a professor for 40 years before he had Alzheimer's. You know, and you do begin losing your keys. And maybe then you do lose your car. And slowly, the worst and most cruel thing imaginable can happen. And in fact, the truth is that in the next 50 years, things with this digital technology that we grasp because we know that you can implant it in your head, and we understand the degree to which memory is expanding, these things that are beginning to expand come with much greater potential for digital loss. And more than that, the questions of personal identity that are raised by our ability to build so much into one device are the same intellectual ones that we've seen in novel technologies over and over again. But now, for me, the question of what is lost and gained in, in technological transformation had finally actually come home to roost in ones and zeros. Encryption, data, backups, Steve Jobs, cool Apple uh, uh, glyphs all over everything, they couldn't save me. And frankly, Neither can medicine save any of us. We all get older. And eventually we do, in fact, all die. Delete. That question and accepting it is one that the digital revolution promises to delay indefinitely. And that in some ways is why we've been so slow, I think, to develop new metaphors. And metaphors that we could teach our students about the new world of losing your homework. I had to accept it 
and I did accept it. I only met one more time with the kids in Abe and Frank's lab about this project. March 19th, I got a call from the Begili lab. It was Abe, and he was incredibly frantic. He said he thought maybe he was actually going to get fired because he'd used this Russian software. He said he needed a friend. He said to come over and, and talk to him, and then this happened. By the way, I can't multitask anymore. I'm you. You can't multitask? Yeah. Can you multitask? Yeah. I just can't do it. Okay. Can you multitask? Yeah. Yes. Can you do this? You found it? <laughs> you must have it. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I was so freaked out. I'm like, how could he be fired? That's not possible. How could he be fired? That's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how? Video. How did it work? <laughs> you know? Of course my password was multitask one star. <laughs> it's taken a long time for me to have the the, the strength, frankly, to talk about this project, because this project is built on, on really feeling awful. But I believe that we always, or at least almost always, have to lose something in order to find a new direction, whether it's our keys, our car, Wilson the volleyball. My friends and my students at UNH have helped me learn over and over again that the transformative power of digital technology is as strong or as weak as the transformative power of teaching and learning. And it is ultimately as much about getting lost as it is about being found. And if I had only one more lecture to give, that's what I'd say. Thank you.